Uh, so I think with that, it is uh, 1.02 p.m. Eastern time. So I think uh, we will go ahead uh, and get started. I'm just going to enable a couple more microphones of uh, people I saw coming in. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Um, I am so excited to have you here for Miriam in the Desert with Alicia Jo Rabins. And as you can tell, I am not Alicia Jo Rabins. Uh, my name is Larissa. I am the program manager here at the Jewish Women's Archive, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about us in a second. Um, but first, I just wanted to go over um, our uh, uh, wonderful tech information again, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So you can see here on the slide um, that you can adjust your volume. You can go ahead and enable your microphone using the drop down menu. Um, but then please, uh, when you are not speaking, um, please mute your microphone just by clicking that button again. And a green line will go through it. And that's how you know um, that uh, you are muted. We also recommend um, wearing headphones that also helps cut down on background noise. Um, so if you're shuffling papers or eating something crunchy, um, the rest of us won't, uh, won't hear it, which will be great. Um, and you can also, if you want, you can go ahead and enable your webcam, uh, but you don't have to. Um, I will say today's program will be highly participatory. Um, so I, I encourage all of you to participate um, by typing into the chat box um, if you don't want to speak, but you should also feel feel free to go ahead and raise your hand um, if you actually want to speak. So just to tell you a little bit about us again, uh, this is a program from the Jewish Women's Archive, um, and we are a national nonprofit dedicated to making known the stories, struggles, and achievements of Jewish women in North America and beyond. Um, on our site, you'll find the world's largest repository of material about and voices of Jewish women. And you can see here, our mission is to document Jewish women's stories, elevate their voices, and inspire them to be agents of change. So it's really, it's um, not just about uh, collecting, um, but it's also about promoting these stories and demonstrating their value uh, to the public. And with that, I also want to say that educators, so many of you who are with us today, you are our partners in our work and in sharing Jewish women's stories. You're the ones who are on the ground um, teaching um, this rich and inclusive history to your students, and you give meaning to our work. We could do as many of these programs as we want and write as many curricula as we want, but it, it, wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't mean anything if you didn't use them. So we really appreciate it, and thank you for being our partners and for being here today. So now on to the main event. <laughs> I know Alicia loves this picture. Um, this is a selfie I took at the playground with my kids <laughs> visiting my family in Florida. Florida. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so again, welcome to Miriam in the Desert with uh, Alicia Jo Rabins. And uh, I'm going to let Alicia mostly introduce herself um, as well as her curriculum and our specific lesson for today. But I did just want to say Alicia is uh, a wonderful person and a woman of many talents. She is an educator, a composer, a musician, a poet, so many other things, and also just a really wonderful person uh, to work with. I've had the pleasure of working with her over the past few months, and I'm just really, really so excited uh, to have her with us today um, to share her work with us. So with that, um, Alicia, take it away. Wonderful. And Larissa, Larissa, before I do, will you remind me, um, sorry, Larissa, will you remind me what time I should make sure to end to give you enough time to do your closing stuff? Just so I can Yeah, try. just like with five, like one, uh, like 55-ish. Okay, great. Wonderful. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's an honor to be in this uh, virtual space with you. And I know some people might be watching this after the fact because it's being recorded. So welcome to you too, across time and space. <laughs> um, my name is Alicia Jo Rabin, so you can just call me Alicia, although I'll happily answer to Alicia Jo. And um, I just want to contextualize this project a little bit before we dive in. Um, so I did a master's in Jewish women's and gender studies at Jewish Theological Seminary in about eight or nine years ago. on studying women um, in Midrash, in rabbinic literature. And when it came time for me to write my thesis, my advisor noticed that I was sort of dragging my feet, but he also had come to see me perform uh, as a musician, which I was doing at the same time, 
and noticed that I had no problem getting it together to make music. So he suggested that I take my research and turn it into songs and annotate them as my master's thesis. Um, so in that way, uh, Girls in Trouble began. So I thought it would just be a way of sort of getting out of a traditional master's thesis. And what it turned into um, is this uh, three album song cycle. Now there's 30 songs about 30 uh, characters, female characters in Torah. Um, and it's called Girls in Trouble. Um, girls is because they're all about girls or women. And the trouble is because I am drawn to the darker and more complicated moments that often people don't learn about when they're in Hebrew school because it's too adult. Um, and then we often kind of stop uh, studying um, some of the Torah stories as we get older. And um, when I began studying Torah as an, a young adult at 21, 22, I was amazed and gratified to find that the complexity of the stories in Torah um, really reflected the complexity of life. That it is not a book about perfect people doing perfect things. It's a book about complicated people making complicated decisions and sometimes doing the right thing and sometimes not. And I feel uh, a lot of power and um, uh, wisdom and company in the more challenging stories, actually. And so for that reason, when I wanted to write my song about Miriam, um, way back when I was writing this thesis, uh, I decided to write not about the moment at the sea, um, where she famously leads the Israelites in this triumphant song, which is very rightfully celebrated in many ways in Jewish traditions. Um, I wanted to write about a less often discussed moment, which happens in the book of Numbers, which we will encounter in a moment, or it's a, a very difficult moment in Miriam's life. Um, after she has been leading the Israelites for a long time and this um, complicated, challenging occurs. And I wanted to give that, that story some attention. And um, even though it's difficult, I wanted to give it actually some, some love. So I wrote a song about her, which I will be performing later. Um, and as time went on and I began traveling to perform these songs and releasing albums, um, since I'm also a Jewish educator, I would also be invited to sometimes teach about the stories behind the songs. And eventually enough people had come up to me saying, can, can you create some material so that I can bring this into my classroom? Um, eventually enough people said that that I, that I was able to make it happen. Um, and thanks to a grant from the Covenant Foundation and support from Joshua Venture Group, um, I have been um, writing a curriculum geared towards teens and adults. Um, but it can be sort of scaled down for some younger um, learners. That is about uh, studying stories of women in Torah through song, my songs, and visual art, which you'll see, um, and text. And so this particular session with you right now is um, kind of framed as a teacher training. So we'll kind of go through the unit um, kind of somewhat briefly. And then I will actually show you the resources that um, a teacher would receive in order to facilitate their teaching of the unit. Um, and so, you know, you don't need to be a teacher, I hope, to experience um, this next hour meaningfully. But if you are a teacher and have specific questions, please feel welcome to just throw them up in the chat, um, out in the chat room, and Alyssa will be, um, you know, speaking them. <laughs> um, so, um, the other thing I want to say before we jump in is that there will be 10 units over the next year launch. We're doing kind of four separate launch events. Um, I'm creating these very in-depth units with visual art and um, scholarly research and all these additional sources. And then I'm teaming up with Jewish Women's Archive and specifically with Larissa to create um, stripped down little modular units that are just about the source text and the song. And so on JWA's site, you can find those, and they're all free. And so that's great if you have maybe like 45 minutes, kind of more concentrated birth. And on our site, which is girlsintroublemusic.com, um, you can download the full curriculum for free as well if you want to have a deeper experience. And they're also intended to be uh, self-study as well. So the teacher notes can be used if you're just interested in learning more about the character. And so Miriam and Ruth are um, up there now for a free download, um, and then eight more will be coming over the course of the next year. Um, so 
I am very excited to, you know, we're really heading into Passover now, um, and um, it's, it's a privilege to spend a little bit of time with Miriam. And as I said, instead of uh, focusing on her song at the sea, we're going to focus on this moment in the desert. So we will begin with the source text. And what I'm going to do in this situation, if we were in a classroom, I would um, have the students pair up in Chabruta partners, groups of two or three, and have them read this text out loud and, um, and d delve into it together. But I'm just going to read it out loud to make sure that it's in our, in our virtual room together. This is from the Book of Numbers. Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses about the Cushite woman he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. They said, has God spoken only through Moses? Has God not spoken through us as well? God heard it. Now Moses was a very humble man, more so than any other man on earth. Suddenly, God called to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. So the three of them went out. God came down in a pillar of cloud, stopped at the entrance of the tent, and called out, Aaron and Miriam. The two of them came forward, and God said, Hear these my words. When a prophet of God arises among you, I make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is trusted throughout my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, plainly and not in riddles, and he beholds the likeness of God. How then did you not shrink from speaking against my servant Moses? Still incensed with them, with Aaron and Miriam, God departed. As the cloud withdrew from the tent, there was Miriam stricken with snow-white scales. When Aaron turned toward Miriam, he saw that she was stricken with scales. Let her not be, oh, sorry. And Aaron said to Moses, Oh, my Lord, account the sin which we committed in our folly. Let her not be as one dead who emerges from his mother's womb with half his flesh eaten away. So Moses cried out to God, saying, O oh God, pray, heal her. But God said to Moses, if that in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut out of camp for seven days, and then let her be readmitted. So Miriam was shut out of camp for seven days. And the people did not march on until Miriam was readmitted. Um, so, again, as a teacher, if we were, you know, in a live room, I would be having you um, pair up, and the room would be loud with your voices reading this out loud to each other, and then you would be um, considering these questions on the next page together. So, I'll just give you a moment um, in this sort of, you know, model of teaching of it to think about this on your own. And please feel free to share them in the chat room or to raise your hand and then, uh, I guess, unmute yourself when Larissa calls on you, if, if any, anything comes to mind. So either question, I think, is great to address. Either what are the most compelling questions that arise as you read this text? And can you think of a modern story from your life or from film or literature where contemporary person experience echoes Miriam's in some way? So I'll just sit with the questions for another second, and then I'm going to go back to the text page. And I do want to say that in the curriculum, I also have the Hebrew text there, but we're going to stick with English for now. We definitely have so, some people typing in. And in my experience, there are some questions that tend to always come out of this text, and then there's additional questions that there's always a new question that I've never heard before, no matter how many times I teach this, um, so which is part of the amazing process of teaching. So Alana just said, uh, she just noticed that Aaron's words to Moses are mentioned prominently in Kol Nidre and throughout Yom Kippur. Uh, what do we make of that connection? It's a really interesting question. So we have multiple people typing now. Great, and I'm going to let the questions sit. So we're going to just name them and let them sit, and um, we won't we won't answer them right now. We're just going to bring them up. Uh, Sheila is saying, I think of our current political circus where people cannot accept uh, that truth can be spoken through a woman. And I think uh, Leah says. Um, 
above, like, why is Miriam punished for something both she and Aaron are caught doing? Which I would say is probably the million dollar question of this particular text. That's definitely a central one. And then she also said, and also where women are silenced when they speak out. And while people are typing, I'll just say that I think these two questions are sort of two almost opposite ways that I find very powerful of connecting with, with an ancient text and bringing it into life. One is asking questions about it, interrogating it, which is a very Jewish rabbinic way to look at a text. We express our love for the text not by, not by accepting everything without questions, but act by actively questioning it and going deeper into it. And the other is by, um, you know, using our creativity to transpose it um, as ancient and strange as some of the specifics may be, um, to kind of creatively transpose it onto our lives today and see ways in which so many of the archetypes um, do just remain true and get lived out again and again in every generation. Uh, so if Ellie, uh, also speaking to that question uh, that came up before about um, the fact that Miriam, only Miriam was pu uh, punished, uh, even though both Aaron and Miriam uh, spoke out against Moses. Uh, so just saying, uh, and what is the history uh, spitting in daughter's faces? Does this occur anywhere else? That's a great question. And that was a line that really, you'll see when I sing my song, that line really um, jumped out at me as an incredibly disturbing and um, you know, poetic, not in a positive sense necessarily, but a, a very strong literary image. God as kind of comparing God's self to a father spitting in a daughter's face. What does that mean about God? Also, Alicia, whenever you want to move forward, you can feel free, and I'll encourage people to still type in their responses if they want to continue to address these questions. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. So maybe we'll we'll get a few more uh, questions, responses, and then and then I will. Awesome. So we have uh, Ellen saying uh, there is a history of men being jealous of the Bible, um, but uh, is uh, is this the first time a woman is jealous of her sibling? Does she have a right? according to a patriarchal orientation. Um, Sarah said, I'm really interested in shame, the emotion, why Miriam is uh, uh, struck, uh, stuck with it. May, I think you might mean uh, struck maybe, but please correct me. Um, and then Sheila uh, said, maybe we eat matzah for seven days to be with Miriam in exile, question, question mark. <laughs> Leah and Rachel have quite a record. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, was the question if a right? Maybe the question is if a woman, if a female is allowed to be jealous of a, a male, or if there's something different. I'm not sure. I'm just wondering. Mm -hmm. Um, L or, uh, uh, I guess uh, P.S. Uh, speaking to uh, obedience, speak truth to power. Um, Ellen saying women often are shamed in years past. Um, an unwed woman was scorned, uh, but the guy got off free of scorn. Okay, great, great. And I really, um, I like to leave these questions unanswered as kind of frustrating as that can be, because every single question is an opening for a whole other discussion. Um, and if you wanted to, you know, if as a teacher, what you wanted to do was kind of just encourage a debate about this and follow those, I think that's great. Um, because I have a, a larger arc of material that I'm interested in, in bringing in, I like to name, encourage people to name the questions and then sort of um, notice how uh, the Jewish form, literary form of Midrash, which many of you are familiar with, but I'll describe it because some of you may not be. So Midrash is the, um, it's a rabbinic literary form, basically, um, an indigenous Jewish li literary form where the rabbis notice problems in a text, in a Jewish text, and they sort of propose a question, and then they propose an answer to it. And sometimes it's a legal, uh, a, a legal question, um, and sometimes it's a narrative question, Midrash Agada. And so in this case, for example, if you say, why was only Miriam punished? Um, that's a big question. And the rabbis might propose different answers to that question, and they can be mutually exclusive exclusive answers, and they can actually all uh, coexist in the sort of, you know, giant body of Torah, which I think is a very beautiful and actually very kind of modern, um, you know, it's almost like a, a comment thread or something where 
these different opinions can, and different versions of the stories uh, can coexist. And actually, what we're going to move on to next is um, a, a few selected rabbinic midrashim that um, I thought really addressed the story in interesting ways. Um, but I do want to say before we see the rabbinic midrashim that part of what I'm interested in doing with this curriculum is encouraging people to create their own midrashim. So classical rabbinic midrash, that period sort of, you know, ended um, in the probably late Middle Ages. Um, but many people are continuing this tradition by creating their own commentary. Sometimes it might be a little written snippet, same as the rabbinic ones, but sometimes it might be a painting, or in my case, a song, or it could be dance or drama. And it is um, a really beautiful way of bringing these texts into our lives, keeping the text alive, updating our imaginations of them, sometimes maybe even rewriting them, if that's what we feel like we need to do. Um, and so it, with this curriculum, part of what I did was to create a gallery of biblical women on the Girls in Trouble website where um, participants are encouraged as part of this unit um, to create their own midrash at the end of the unit. And then if they want, they're welcome to upload it with their name or anonymously um, onto the gallery. Um, and so that's another reason why I think, you know, naming these questions and then sort of leaving them and seeing if something is a burning question for someone, it's wonderful because they're going to get to propose their own answer to it later. So let's look at a few rabbinic midrashim. Or do you want to just, maybe Larissa, do you want to just name a couple of more questions before we jump into that? Um, sure. So we just had a, a couple more. Um, let's see where I was. So uh, Ellen uh, had said, Rachel and Leah, yes, referring uh, back to the comment about their rivalry. Uh, but Miriam is jealous of her brother in engaging in this gossip. And then Alana said, uh, the grassroots seem to be behind Miriam rather than God. Right. So it's a great observation that at the end, the people wait for Miriam to be readmitted to camp before moving on and they're wandering in the desert. Really nice. Um, so let's look at how the rab what questions come to the rabbis um, and how they have answers to them. Um, oh, actually, first I'll do mine. <laughs> I kind of change around the order sometimes. So I'm going to sing my song. Um, and one of the main questions that I had um, was actually just what would this experience feel like for Miriam after having dedicated so much of her life to leadership of the Jewish, you know, of the Israelites in the desert? Um, how, how would her experience of, of God's actions feel? So um, the lyrics, you can feel free to, you know, close your eyes and just listen or follow along on screen. Um, Well, my mother named me a bitter. Although as a child, I was so kind. Hiding myself in the trees to watch over my brother. But still my name was bitter. Bitter the taste of the sea, bitter the cries of the horses drowning behind us. If anybody had asked me, I might not have chosen to go, but everyone knows. Sometimes they don't have a choice. Sorry, that got left off lyrics. <laughs> so when they said you're banished, seven days in the desert alone, I just started walking. I knew there was nothing to say. Scorpions and a spider crawled up to me and stopped in my shade. Together in silence, we watched as the sun crossed the sky. And 
with your father, sit in your face. What I knew under is nothing. And if you're scared to snow, what I knew has to go. And if your God should turn from you, what at you turn to? Still, I don't regret a minute, and I don't regret an hour of the week that I lived all alone at the top of the mountain. So no voice came down from heaven, and I never saw words written in fire. I did see the birds of prey pick all the carcasses And if your father spit in your face, wouldn't you want to leave that place? And if your skin should turn to snow, wouldn't you have to go? And if your God should turn from you, wouldn't you turn? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so for the teachers out there, and actually for everyone, um, I'm actually going to type our website down, and every song um, from Girls in Trouble is available streaming on the website, so you can just listen to them all, and you can search by character. Um, and they each each song also has um, the lyrics on it, and some of them have live video. So if you're a teacher and and you're um, wanting to even teach a song that is not that we don't have one of the in-depth units about, you can definitely use our website as an educational um, resource in that way. And when you download um, the unit, if you're um, for teaching or for self-study, it also comes with an MP3. Um, and the recordings are sort of full band, so, you know, me right now, it's just me and my guitar, but there's, um, pulling it out more. Um, so that is my midrash, um, and I share that, you know, um, in this context, especially for the teachers, um, as a way of hopefully helping, um, helping people connect with a story that might feel kind of old and strange with all the kind of leprosy and skin like snow and, and I, I try to bring it into a personal perspective and when I write these songs I try to think of a way in which I can relate to the story no matter how different the particulars are but a moment that I experience something that feels in whatever small way um, similar to what that character was going through on a mythical archetypal scale. Um, and so now I want to look at a few uh, rabbinic midrashim, and we'll look, look at them very quickly, but I just want to give you a sense of um, other realms of conversation around this story. So um, here's the first one, and this, um, this is one of the most kind of famous interpretations of this story. Devarim Rabbah. The rabbis say, know that leprosy comes on account of speaking slander, lashon hara. Look at the righteous Miriam. Because she spoke slander of her brother Moses, she was stricken with plagues. As it is written, remember what the Lord your God did to Miriam along the way as you were leaving Egypt. Um, and so if we were really doing this, I would, you know, uh, have a whole discussion about, um, you can see below, which of your questions about the original text does this Midrash address and which does it leave unanswered? Um, I mean, clearly this, uh, it seems to 
this doesn't really address the, the question of why only Miriam was uh, punished, because Miriam and Aaron both seem to have spoken against Moses. Um, and it's definitely interpreting her speaking against Moses uh, as, as slander, which is not the only way to look at it. Um, but I also think it's interesting that they still consider her to be righteous, um, that they're not saying, look how terrible Miriam was and how she needed to be um, punished because of something inherent in her, but that even this righteous uh, prophetess, Miriam, um, they're sort of using this story as a teaching tool to say, um, speaking ill of someone else is so dangerous to the community um, that even someone as righteous as Miriam is punished in this very kind of painful, visible way because of it. And um, in the in the curriculum, which can again be used as self study, I have a lot of thoughts about it that are uh, written down there. So if you do want to, you know, think more deeply about this, I, I encourage you to download that for free. Um, and the next thing that appears in the curriculum is this little sidebar of everything you wanted to know about leprosy, but we're afraid to ask. Um, and I will just read this to. to um, fill out this aspect of the story. So multiple sections of the Torah are concerned with the diagnosis and treatment of Sara'at, commonly translated as leprosy. Our story is one of the few narrative moments, narrative moments about Sara'at. It's important to know that Sara'at, though translated leprosy, is not the same as modern medical leprosy. Modern leprosy is a bacterial disease of the human body. Sara'at is considered to be a spiritual illness which manifests in skin ailments and also appears in clothes in the walls of houses. If you're really into the leprosy stuff, there's a great article in the Jewish Encyclopedia with more details about what biblical leprosy probably looks like and how it agreed to be conflated with medical leprosy, which, you know, for certain students, this might be an interesting, <laughs> some people are into gross stuff, so this could be an interesting uh, way in for them. And again, I'm trying to leave as many doors open um, for genuine engagement with the text. Um, Midrash, too, addresses the question that Leah, um, you know, spoke in the chat room which is, again, that million dollar question about this text. Um, why was Miriam punished? So Miriam and Aaron spoke, Vatidaber is the Hebrew, against Moses. So Vatidaber is the feminine, you know, Hebrew is a gender language. So it's, that's the feminine way of saying um, spoke. It's not plural. It's not plural with a woman and a guy, as it should be here, but it's uh, a singular feminine verb. So the they notice that grammatical irregularity, and they interpret that to mean that um, although both of them spoke against Moses, Miriam initiated the conversation. Miriam did not normally speak before Aaron, but she did in this case because it was urgent. Which again, we have this tension between she spoke and was punished for it, uh, and yet there's an acknowledgement that she needed to say what she was saying, which I think is a fascinating tension, not really solved by this midrash. So what this midrash does propose is that the reason that Miriam is punished and not Aaron is because she initiated the speaking, um, which again, you know, arguments against that are always welcome in my classroom. <laughs> um, you know, you can certainly argue with these rabbis for sure. Um, uh, but I think there's also an interesting lesson to, to think about, um, is it the same to initiate uh, an action and to go along with it? Like if, if, we, do if we do say that maybe, you know, if we, if we accept the premise that um, maybe she was doing something wrong here, which I don't necessarily think, but if we just accept that for a moment, then they're saying there's a difference between initiating slander or, you know, something uh, mean to someone else. Uh, and going along with it, and the person who initiates can be punished differently, which again raises an interesting question that I think in a middle school or high school classroom, I think would, um, could provoke a lot of interesting discussion. Um, and I see Ellen is saying that she's not satisfied with the answer. I think that's wonderful. Um, and again, that's why it was so important to me to have a, a section where at the end, participants are in, encouraged to create their own answers because these are not the answers. They are just an answer. <laughs> they are, they are uh, individual answers. Um, and I think that coming up with our own answers, even if it's just, um, well, that was, you know, within the context of the society at that time, it's something that um, was unfair about what was happening. Or if there's a way that you want to twist the story and, and make it fair, kind of rewrite it, whatever that answer is, I think it's, it's um, 
definitely within our right and um, almost our obligation to argue argue with the rabbi, just like we're supposed to struggle with, with the original text. So thank you for um, sharing that response. And yes, I agree that uh, um, Elena is saying um, the rabbis do share this question. They also notice it doesn't seem fair. And that's, that is that um, is meaningful, I think. So one last rabbinic midrash. Um, and this is uh, Sifre, from a collection called Sifre. Miriam and Moses, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses about the matter of his wife, which remember that was the original text. How did Miriam know that Moses had separated from the commandment to be fruitful and multiply? Because she saw that his wife was no longer wearing jewelry. Miriam said to her, why have you stopped wearing jewelry? His wife answered, your brother is not diligent about the matter. A very delicate way of saying he's not observing the commandment to be fruitful and multiply. This is when people generally laugh <laughs> in class. Then Miriam knew and spoke to Aaron, and the two of them spoke against Moses. Um, so again, if we were in a real room, we'd be you know, having this very lively discussion. And I'm sorry that this is only my voice, but um, I love this midrash. It's so strange and surprising. Um, this midrash identifies that in the original text, there are two complaints that Miriam and, and Aaron uh, speak against Moses. One is, um, why is God only talking to Moses? And one is this mysterious thing that they spoke against Moses about the matter of his wife. And no one quite knows what that means. There's a lot of different interpretations. Uh, I am fascinated by this one. This one really reads deep into it, sort of writes a whole other backstory that's not in the original text, but that says that uh, Moses was not sleeping with his wife. And that's what Miriam and Aaron were complaining to God about. And the way that they knew that was because this wife was no longer wearing jewelry. She had stopped, you know, take it, taking care of herself. And, um, and Miriam said, why have you stopped wearing jewelry? And she sort of, in this coded language, said uh, he's not very careful about things. And Miriam knew what that meant. Um, it's interesting to note that Miriam has this history of intervening when people, uh, when husbands and wives are um, not uh, fulfilling the mitzvah to be fruitful and multiply, right, when they're not um, being intimate with each other. Past has intervened, even with her own parents, actually. Um, and so she has, I, I think that's part of where the rabbis are, are getting this, that she has this tradition of um, being, um, being the intervener in this very strange, very intimate situation. Um, this is an example of one that, you know, you, you clearly might not use with 11-year-olds uh, or 12-year-olds, and that's part of the reason why I say this curriculum is for teens and adults and could certainly be um, adapted younger in age. But one of the things I love about the original text and the rabbinic interpretations is, again, how adult they are. Um, and how, I mean, this is, like, frankly, this is a sex positive text. This is a text that's saying um, that, that um, Miriam is doing something important by uh, intervening in um, this, this marriage. And that there's this sort of secret language of, of women where the wife is, is showing her something. Um, and it's not the kind of thing that we necessarily think of when we think of like what the rabbis say talks about leprosy. Um, and again, it's another interesting just way into the text that you can say, I think this is ridiculous and comes out of nowhere. Or you can say, I love this and it leads me to these other conclusions. Um, but I love bringing it into the conversation. <laughs> I'm not going to read Sheila's comment, but if you want to look down in the chat room, you'll see why I'm laughing. <laughs> um, all right. So this is a little zooming through these midrashim. Um, I will say that um, there is probably too much information intentionally in any one unit that we've created. Um, unless you have like a three hour seminar, um, we really wanted to ha be, um, have it be a rich resource. Teachers feel empowered to say, wow, I think this crazy uh, midrash about Moses and his wife not sleeping together would really grab my students' interest um, in this particular context. So I'm only going to use this one. Or, you know, you know, my students are really interested, like having a lot, you know, I teach in high school and there's a lot of social issues with gossip. So I'm going to teach the gossip that um, makes sense for you and your interests. Um, we definitely encourage people to, teachers, to edit down 
you know, ruthlessly edit, just take what you feel like um, would be interesting, even if it's just a song. And again, that's part of why JWA has um, versions on their website that are just source text and song, so that if that's what you have time for or interest in, that's great. Um, so now we're going to move on to the final uh, section here, which is visual art. And um, some of the art that we found, a lot of it is not Jewish because there was this, you know, a prohibition against um, this, uh, drawing figures. So a lot of it is Christian, but we have definitely done as much as we can to find Jewish artists and um, women artists. This is about really fascinating engraving, I think. This is when God in this story appears as a cloud. And um, one thing I love about this is the relationship between the three figures, where there's Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, and they're, they all seem to be equidistant from God. They're all right there at the cloud. There's no hierarchy. Um, there's this amazing uh, kind of tabernacle image of angels woven into the curtain in the background. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty empowering version of, of Miriam right here, um, even though she's about to be stricken with leprosy, but there's an egalitarianism. And if you look at this next image, this is a very old Byzantine um, image, and you can see Miriam's off on the right, and uh, there is some parchment damage, but her face also, we consulted with an art history scholar who confirmed that her face and hands are also, they're spotted. So that's the leprosy depiction. She's off to the side. You'll notice she doesn't have a halo. Um, Moses and Aaron are, are there in the middle. And um, the hand of God is up above, which is a pretty frequent depiction. So looking side by side can provoke a lot of, com and I'm, you know, breaking all my rules of teaching by telling you this frontally, but um, since this is just a little teacher training kind of, you know, add water, <laughs> kind of a condensed seminar, that's why I'm doing this. Um, but if I were with students, I would show these two side by side. And I'll say the download of the units also includes a PowerPoint where we have a slide that's these two side by side. And you can ask participants, um, you know, what's the difference between the way Miriam is portrayed how did the artist make a decision um, uh, that shows their interpretation of the story? Um, some, some of the units, like Ruth, the other unit that's published now, um, has maybe 12 images. This is a very, very rarely depicted story. So I really encourage people to create their own depictions because I think there's room for a lot more art about this story. It's one of the least depicted stories in the in the Torah, I think, in terms of um, visual and literary art. This is a French artist um, who painted a lot and drew a lot of um, pictures of um, uh, sort of people on the fringes of society. He really focused on that. And then he had a religious awakening, a Catholic conversion. And then he started to take his interest in uh, the socially marginalized and um, combine it with his interest in the, um, um, with the Bible. And so this is a great example of that. So that's some context for this. But you can see in this version, um, Miriam, you know, in that first one, she was very powerful and young and sort of dancing. Um, and here she's, she seems to be this old woman um, with this kind of empty basket, sitting in the sun, building her eyes, barefoot. Um, it's a different moment in the story, but it's also a very different imagining of Miriam. Again, an amazing thing about Midrash, whether Jewish or Christian or whatever, is that these interpretations can all uh, coexist, even if they're mutually exclusive. Um, and the final art um, imagery that I'll share is Fiona Benjamin. She's an amazing, she's a Bene Israel um, Jew, so she's from um, the uh, Mumbai Jews from India, and she currently lives in New Jersey. She does a lot of paintings about Jewish culture and Indian Jewish culture. Um, and this is one about Miriam. And you can see um, she sort of has this kind of tefillin um, on her arm, and they're sprouting into this kind of beautiful tree. Um, this one is not strictly about our story, but it was such a powerful depiction of Miriam sort of 
walking off, um, you know, certainly not also, I don't think about the song at the sea, and I felt like it was related enough. She's got this, you know, packed up suitcase, she's wearing this talit on her head, and she's been out, and to me it was very resonant with some of the um, energy in the story, it's a beautiful depiction. Um, Alana's asking it early, and if there's dance works on this story, and we don't, the Judith unit, which will come out in the fall, um, has some amazing uh, dance in it, but this particular one doesn't. Um, but what I want to show you next, so this is sort of the closing of the uh, slideshow of the actual work from, from the curriculum. And I just want to show you, um, with Larissa's help now, the, the curriculum as it appears when you download it, um, just so that you know what you'll be getting. And this will also include how I suggest you encourage participants to make their work. Um, I have a beautiful graphic designer in, um, in London who's um, doing all the units. So there's a lot of intro matter, um, which kind of goes a little deeper, and some practical advice, um, some thoughts about why I focus on this moment in Miriam's life, and some background about Miriam's life, which some of you, you know, may know and some of you may not, and it can be a useful thing to read to students if they're coming from um, a less textually educated background. I have a su suggested lesson plan. Um, everything is, of course, very open to adaptation. My goal is that people will use this however it works for them, but as a resource. Um, so you can see at the bottom of the orange is visual art, and then this might be a little small on your screen, but and then the yellow box is create your own midrash. And so I'll just scroll down and we will get to that. Um, and here's the biblical text that we went through together. And oh, the, <laughs> it's appearing crazy, but that's the Hebrew text. <laughs> Um, and then the questions for discussion with some room for notes, um, the song lyrics with the questions for discussion, and then the midrashim, and you can see how that leprosy sidebar appears, um, midrash two, and the green is the teacher's notes. And so when you download the curriculum, it comes with a teacher version and a separate PDF of a student version without the teacher notes, so you can just print off the student version, and then the, and then the teacher version's for you with all the notes. And then here's the visual art, and I forget if I said this, but your download also comes with a PowerPoint. So these are small, but you can just show them to participants um, on a screen, or even on your computer if it's a small class. And then here we get to the create, to the final section, create, which again is definitely optional. If you have a short class and no time, that's fine, but definitely also encouraged um, and so we have some, some ideas to jumpstart creative interpretations. Write a journal entry by Miriam during her time in the desert. Write a letter from Miriam to someone in the story. Um, the question of does this story remind you of any experiences in your own life of people you know and tell the story. Sketch what you think Miriam looked like before, during, or after this experience. Uh, and the write, write a dialogue between Miriam and God, some more kind of playwriting. And Miriam and God, Moses or Aaron at any point during the story. Use movement or dance to physically interpret the moment Miriam is struck with leprosy. Write a traditional style midrash. So for people who dis disagreed with midrashing, this might be a nice way to just directly <laughs> write your own. Uh, solving one of the difficulties you found in the, in the story by proposing an additional moment in the narrative, a close reading of the original text, or another literary solution. And simply summarizing Miriam's story in six words can be an interestingly powerful way to uh, create something. There's this sheet, if people have more trouble getting started, there's a sheet of um, a sort of Jewish framework for making creative midrash and using um, the Pardes model, which I won't go into, but it's in here, of Pshat, Drash, Remez, and so it has different aspects of uh, going into the literal meaning of the story or going into the most kind of mysterious, um, far out interpretation of the story or anything in between to help, help give people some creative framework. And then finally, um, there's an appendix, and this, uh, again, I'll say that I, I intend this to be used totally for teachers and totally for self-study. You know, if someone is not a teacher but is interested in going deep into one of these stories, um, so the appendix, if you are just doing it self-study, you may even want to just jump to the back. Um, Miriam in the Desert, Explanation of a Musical Midrash. So that's my writing of what I was thinking when I wrote this song. And then there's the lyrics, which appear above, but this time the lyrics are annotated with my references, sort of going, hearkening back to the beginning of uh, this project as my master's thesis. So, for example, the first line was that my mother named me bitter. 
Um, and the note says the Hebrew etymology of Miriam can be read in various ways. One common way is to interpret her name as bitter waters, uh, since the first two letters, mem, resh, mean bitter, and the last two, yud, mem, mean sea. So that the root of bitter is in that word, and that's why that line, my mother named me bitter, starts. Um, and again, that can be an interesting way to, um, if you have a shorter session and you just want to give students um, a meaningful, memorable introduction to a story in Torah, you could just have them read it, ask a couple questions about the story, play the song, and have them go through this, and suddenly they have um, all these, you know, a kind of pretty wide range of information about this character um, in a pretty palatable form of, of uh, Indie, indie folk <laughs> music. Um, that is, uh, and, and finally, credits and bibliography. Um, and that is my teacher training introduction to the Miriam unit. Again, Miriam and Ruth are available for free, both at JWA sites uh, in the condensed version and in the full version on girlsintroublemusic.com. I'm easy to find and get in touch with through contact pages, aliciajoe.com or the Girls in Trouble site if you um, want to ask me anything. And um, that's sort of the end of my official uh, presentation. I'm so uh, grateful to be here with you. And I really wish everyone a wonderful Pesach. Um, and I welcome questions. And I know also Larissa has some closing comments. Yes, let's see um, if anyone has a couple questions. And just also real quick, again, we gave you the links, but uh, this is where you can access both the full curriculum and uh, the condensed version. And if you click on these links now, you won't be kicked out of the meeting room, so you should feel free to go ahead and, and click on them. And all of my other songs are also on there, so if you're interested in, you know, Hagar, Tamar, <laughs> Bat Yiftah, there's a wide range of all different songs, um, so please feel free to explore around. We can type in going on. Maybe not. So I think um, I just have a few uh, announcements to make. So maybe I'll go ahead and start those, but then uh, feel free to type in uh, your questions as I talk, and then we can grab those at the end. Um, and again, uh, thank you so much uh, to Alicia for being here um, and for sharing uh, sharing this with us today, um, and also to uh, all of you, all the participants who uh, who joined us. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, so just very quickly. Uh, we have another online learning program on Thursday, June 9th uh, with Torsky finalist Michelle Boyle. A lot of you probably know about our annual educator award that we give out, um, the Natalia Torsky Educator Award. And every year we um, have a winner and a finalist. Michelle Boyle, um, who's a teacher locally, um, was our finalist last year. And she'll be with us on June 9th. Uh, the time is to be determined, but it will be in the evening. So just go ahead and block out uh, that evening so you can make sure to be with us and uh, we'll have more information about that shortly. Um, I also wanna mention that we are actively recruiting uh, for our um, teen fellowship program, The Rising Voices. Um, this is a, a national 10 month program open to female identified teens in grades 10 through 12. Um, Participants uh, blog monthly for JWA and uh, also participate in monthly webinars um, as well as in-person retreats um, uh, to discuss uh, topics such as Judaism, feminism, pop culture, and social justice. Uh, so if you know um, any uh, Jewish uh, teen girls in this uh, category um, who you think would be a good fit for our program, please tell them about the Rising Voices Fellowship. It's really uh, a wonderful program, um, and we hope to have a lot of uh, really strong applicants. Um, and then last but not least, uh, your feedback uh, on these programs is extremely important to us. Uh, we want to make sure that we're providing you with um, programming uh, that is enjoyable and useful. Um, so um, I would ask that um, today after you uh, leave this meeting that uh, you please take a moment to fill out this survey. Um, and I'll just also mail it to you directly after to be like, um, but it is very important, important to us. So um, please, please uh, do that. And thank you again to everyone. Let me see if we have any. I see, I see a question from Jennifer about thoughts about teaching an all-female versus mixed gender class group. 
That's a great question. I've done a lot of teaching in, in both, and I think it, they're both powerful in different ways. And I think, um, I think different, different energy arises in both, and it kind of depends on your situation. But it's certainly not intended all, only for girls or women, um, but different kinds of conversations do tend to happen in those spaces. And I want to thank JWA as well for offering this and offering it as a free resource. It's such a um, service to the community. Thanks so much, Louisa, for working with me. Of course, it's a pleasure to work with you, uh, Alicia, and uh, we hope we'll have you uh, back again for another program soon. Um, it looks like uh, Alana might be typing a question and then we'll go ahead and uh, let people go. Oh, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> um, I, and I just want to remind people that if they are inspired to create their own um, commentaries, please feel free to then contribute them to the gallery on our website under your name or anonymously. And they don't have to be perfect. The idea, you know, it can even just be a sketch. Um, and if you go on there, you can search by character and see all the work that people have have created. Um, and hopefully that will continue to grow. So it can be also, I think, a fun way to kind of honor your your students. Um, creations and show them that you know they can create something in the classroom and then upload it and 